Okay, let's get started. Hello to everyone joining us today. Uh, just for a time check, it's Wednesday, 2nd December at 5 p.m. in Singapore. I'm Amina Mahmood. I'm the Deputy Director of the Singh Health Duke NUS Global Health Institute, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you on behalf of the Institute. As we all know, in recent days, it seems we have a number of potentially successful vaccines in the pipeline. And in fact, if you heard, we earlier today heard that Britain has approved emergency use of the Pfizer vaccine. So we live in exciting times. Uh, and this puts the discussion we will have today even more in the limelight. But as you may have inferred from the title of this webinar series, which is Beyond Science, Issues of Access, this webinar focuses not on the discovery of vaccines, but rather the delivery of vaccines and what are the issues surrounding that delivery. Our central concern is really how do we ensure the majority of the world's population can access vaccines once they are available? There are a whole host of challenges that go beyond the scientific challenges. And across these two webinars, we look at some of these challenges. Um, and today we'll be looking at the legal and regulatory challenges. There's also really an issue of um, what is the global cooperation and uh, collaboration that is needed uh, to get us to where we want to be, which is you know accessing this vaccine for the majority of the world's population. Um, we kind of want to stress this is really a global issue that needs attention from everyone. And we don't think that by bolstering national boundaries, we'll be able to contain the virus or even the impact of the virus at all. So we are really kind of delighted to kind of have this opportunity to speak to you about these challenges in our second webinar which is a week from today, next Wednesday on 9 December, we'll focus a little bit more on the distributional challenges. But today's panel of speakers will bring their own very unique perspectives on the legal issues surrounding COVID-19 vaccines, therapeutics, and products. Between the three of them, they have a wealth of knowledge on these topics, and I'm really excited to hear their presentations. I'm also really grateful for their participation in this webinar and would like to thank them again for taking the time to be with us. I'm going to um, present uh, uh, each of them in I turn. Each of them will talk about eight to 10 minutes, following which we'll have a panel discussion where they'll ask questions to each other, and we'll also be taking questions from the audience. So please post your questions in the question and answer box at any time during the presentation and then kind of after the presentations are done, we'll be looking at those and hoping, hoping that we can address them and have a good, nice interactive session here. So with that, I'll go to introducing our first speaker, who is Lena Menghani. She is a South Asia head of the MSF's Access Campaign. Her area of work and expertise is public health, innovation and intellectual property. She is an LLB from the University of Delhi. She works with government, civil society, and other stakeholders to implement public health safeguards in Indian patent law. Since 2005, Lena has been providing technical support for legal challenges filed by public interest groups and people living with HIV AIDS against pending patent applications covering HIV and other essential drugs for neglected co-infections. More recently, as part of the MSF Access Campaign, she has been working on to address patent and regulatory barriers in India. She will present some of the challenges related to making access to vaccines and therapeutics available across the globe, and I really look forward to her insights. I will now hand over to her, Lena. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting uh, Doctors Without Borders, Medicines for Frontiers. Um, for those of you who are familiar with us and for those who are not familiar with us, we work in contexts of conflict, but we also work with very excluded populations such as the Rohingyas and, uh, you know, drug users, people in with HIV and have played a role in past epidemics like the HIV AIDS epidemic um, and, of course, the Ebola outbreak in, the, uh, in Africa. So coming from that very context, I would just like to uh, share some uh, thoughts that would get the discussion off the ground. So I'm just um, uh, starting with my presentation. Yeah. So firstly, I would like to say that uh, I'm part of a small group of people in MSF who were dedicatedly uh, set up with the 1999 Nobel Peace Prize to look at the kind of barriers that countries, developing countries particularly faced on accessing diagnostic tools, drugs, and vaccines. And uh, of course, that particular perspective plays a huge role in the COVID-19 pandemic. 
Uh, so I work with epidemiologists, I work with diagnostic experts, I work with lawyers and pharmacists and, and, uh, and a team that actually dedicatedly looks at these therapeutics and vaccines on a daily basis. So a lot of my knowledge is over to them. Um, if you look at some of the key emerging issues that are uh, coming out of the COVID pandemic, or rather uh, people are talking about on a daily basis, um, as one of the key policy issues is the lack of play, uh, level playing field on tests, drugs, and vaccines procurement. Uh, we saw that very early on, for example, with reagents from Roche. Um, you know, um, many developing countries, particularly, were struggling with access to reagents. Um, again, we saw this in the situation where the United States uh, bought up a large consignment of, uh, at that time, uh, what was approved for emergency use remdesivir um, for COVID-19. And similarly, uh, more recently, Oxfam and other reports, and I'm sure others will also illustrate that, uh, a small group of nations with very deep pockets have bought up more than half the future supply of, le of the leading COVID-19 vaccine. Now, I want to dwell on this fact that what does it mean? If you look at uh, WHO's advice to countries and what countries are thinking themselves is that we need to vaccinate healthcare workers, frontline workers. We need to vaccinate uh, the most uh, uh, vulnerable population, the elderly. We also need to vaccinate people with comorbidities. Um, how do you do that when the supply for 2021 is already uh, taken up by a few countries? who will obviously expand vaccination beyond healthcare workers and the elderly uh, to the general population, while other countries will not be, be, will be struggling to even vaccinate frontline workers and, and, and vulnerable populations. So it immediately creates an unequal access to uh, what people have been sort of uh, awaiting. And uh, we've seen this with drugs, we've seen this with other commodities. And of course, this is going to be discussed further in, in today's webinar. The second issue I'm going to talk about is the lack of transparency. The lack of transparency um, is, is not just about the agreements that uh, you know, universities and companies are signing with each other or companies are signing with each other. It's also relating to the vital, um, uh, vital clinical trial data that actually uh, you know, a large um, part of the media has been reporting on. For example, three different vaccine uh, manufacturers claimed that the uh, vaccine was 90% and over effective. Was that based on peer reviewed data? Was the data already submitted to regulators and had the regulators already provided preliminary reports on that data? No, um, this was actually majority of what, uh, what was being claimed came from media reports, which is not to say that they may not be correct, but the fact remains that we, are, we have a long way to go where regulators will have to prioritize looking at the data and providing a transparent way of providing the decisions, back to back the decisions that they, when they, when they take the decision to approve or not approve a vaccine. So I think the lack of transparency uh, is, is particularly uh, glaring in the case of uh, clinical trial data. And I think uh, it's time that the, uh, you know, the Pfizer and Moderna, and of course, other uh, manufacturers as well, uh, started to make the data publicly available, and not just through peer reviewed journals, but even the data that is submitted to regulators must be made available so that uh, independently can be scrutinized. Uh, then you have um, something that of course has sort of swept uh, the IP world uh, is the South African India proposal for a TRIPS wave one. I'll come to that. Um, you know, intellectual property is a is is a small community. I would say always. When I first joined it, uh, I was a lawyer and I had uh, just passed out. And one thing I realized about the intellectual property community was that they actually believed and 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 intellectual property as an ideology and not as a tool. Um, and that was really very disturbing for me because you, I had worked on uh, uh, constitutional rights and had worked on different uh, rights under, uh, you know, uh, in India. And I found the kind of um, uh, sort of, you know, um, the kind of debates, hot debates that people would start having with you the moment you started to talk about how the intellectual property system worked, 
um, actually not conducive to the manner in which we needed to use it and reform it. So the South African India proposal for TRIPS paper has once again done that. It has opened up a debate on the intellectual property system, and I'm going to come to that. Uh, so what is MSF's experience with IP system? We are not talking from an academic point of view. We are people who procure medicines. We do patent landscapes. We look at patent status before we take a drug into a particular country. Um, we look at licensing contracts. So our daily bread and butter for our procurement and supply is requires us to deal with the intellectual property system, whether we like it or not. Uh, one of the first things we realized was the monopolies created by intellectual property systems are linked to high prices. And we saw that for fluconazole, we've seen this for, you know, direct acting antivirals for hepatitis C um, and, and so on. So one of the issues that we directly face as a treatment provider is high prices due to monopolies, uh, which intellectual property uh, creates. But a second problem, a uh, tier of problem, which is that um, pharma companies tend to delay registering the products in developing countries because they don't see them as lucrative markets. So this is bound to happen in COVID-19 where majority of markets that pharma companies would like to enter would be the high income countries first. And they might delay very crucial technologies to developing countries. Uh, the second thing is, um, which is well known, is just the failure to, to look at neglected populations and developing country needs. I need not go into uh, it, but you know, a glaring example is the lack of heat stable vaccines, heat stable pediatric formulations, um, you know, um, the lack of uh, new drugs, new antibiotics, TB, malaria, uh, and I could go on. The list is, is, is quite big in terms of how the intellectual property system has failed neglected populations. Um, and these problems are not independent and unrelated because it's a fundamental nature of the IP system and the pharmaceutical market uh, that it creates, that it um, obviously uh, incentivizes people to go towards uh, richer people and the most lucrative side of, of the market. Um, much of the money that is generated by the intellectual property system, it actually does not go back into R&D, which is very interesting when some of you look at the evidence. So these are some of the key issues that have cropped up on IP with MSF experience. And this is what South Africa and India have stated as a response to COVID-19. So what are South Africa and India and joined by Kenya and, and a few other countries um, that all mem WTO members countries on a temporary basis uh, till the pandemic is over or the vaccine is widely available, suspend certain kinds of intellectual property rights. Now, we would just sort of a lot of people would say, why are we so concerned about intellectual property rights? Because it's directly linked to the challenges to ensure global uninterrupted production, supply and affordable access. Now, I would just like to highlight that as a treatment activist, while people fixate on the vaccine, the vaccine is not going to be available to everybody tomorrow. People are still going to get sick and still going to die from COVID-19 in the years um, in the next few years, we are still going to need testing, we are still going to need reagents, we are still going to need uh, uh, antiviral drugs um, and all the different classes of drugs that are being explored. So when we look at the intellectual property proposal, we have to put on um, not just uh, um, a discussion based on vaccines, but a much wider debate about ventilators, about masks, about drugs, and of course, um, um, quite importantly, some of the background technology that governs uh, vaccines. Uh, so what is the issue when it comes to intellectual property? Because intellectual property um, is being filed as we speak. So a lot of the patent landscapes are just not available at the moment because patent applications are, are sort of, you know, made public after 12 to 18 months. Um, it basically means that if you are in a country where a patent is applied for and granted, um, manufacturers in that particular country, put, they cannot enter the market without fearing patent infringement suits. So it's very critical for long-term sustainability that the chilling impact of intellectual property enforcement be removed uh, uh, to, to sort of maneuver what uh, capacity we have in the region and globally. And of course, 
uh, very importantly, we are coming down to the voluntary measures that are being announced by pharma companies. And I don't doubt that some of them are meant sincerely, others are more for public relations. But traditionally, we have worked with voluntary licenses and, and we've seen uh, unequal access in, in a lot of middle income countries due to voluntary licenses. We think uh, that a global automatic expedited solution, uh, which allows a waiver of IPA obligations uh, is very critical at this point to sort of unlock the capacity of the developing world to scale up uh, many of the life-saving essential tools that should be available for COVID-19. And I'm going to stop here because uh, I don't want to infringe on my next speaker's uh, time. Thanks. Um, thanks, Lena. That was great. Uh, I'm sure you brought up a lot of uh, points that are uh, very you know, open to further discussion. But uh, before we get into that, I will introduce our next speaker, who is Chris Vendu Rompelli, which I'm sure I'm mispronouncing his last name. Of course not, of course not. That's fine. <laughs> He's a senior associate with the intellectual property team in the KNL Gates Melbourne office. He has a master of commercial law from the University of Melbourne and is a regular contributor to the research and startup sector. He provides education and mentoring on topics of identifying, protecting, and leveraging <laughs> intangible assets. Prior to transitioning to the IP profession, Chris obtained his PhD in degree in microbiology and immunology from the University of Adelaide. He spent six years as a postdoctoral researcher in vaccine development, during which time he developed and patented two key technologies related to vaccine. So today he brings both his legal perspective combined with his technical technology background to address us today. And I think he'll be you know, clarifying for some of you some of the kind of overlying um, patents and um, intellectual property rights that you might have questions about just what is the landscape all about. So over to you, Chris. Thank you, um, Amina, and, and look, thank you to yourself and your team for uh, in the invitation to speak. Um, um, a fantastic session, and, and as you touched on, I guess I, I sort of bridged two two uh, areas. You know, I, I do have my my heart is still in research to some extent, but I, I you know, my function really is to help, you know, not not only companies but individuals protect their IP. And I thought, I guess I'd, I'd take a step back initially and. and just to give you a few points of overview, you know, give a brief introduction as to what IP is and why it matters. Um, definitely focusing on patents and then just touching on some concluding comments. You know, at the end of the day, I don't think these, there is going to be one straightforward solution to the problems we're facing with accessibility. But let's, let's just do a bit of IP 101. What is IP and why, do, why does it matter? Intellectual property is, is a product of your intellect, intangible asset. It's a creation of the mind that is commercially artistic or artistically useful and can be protected using particular uh, legal regimes. Um, we all have one of these. I'd like to get rid of mine, really. But um, this really sort of gives a highlight as, as to the types of common IP protection um, that we see in our day-to-day -day life. So trademarks are for signs that are used in the course of trade. We know we, we all know famous trademarks. Designs protect features of shape and configuration. Um, copyright, uh, you know, artistic and literary works, also software. Um, trade secrets, not, not traditionally an IP right per se, but it's, it's confidential information, um, technical information, know-how, uh, protected through contractual arrangements, and, and of course, last but not least, we have patents. Um, patents protect how things work. They can protect products. And, and that's what we're going to focus on. Um, why is IP important? Well, you know, whether you're a small business and individual startup that is looking to, to carve their niche in a marketplace, it is the language of business, like, like property, real estate, you can buy, sell, um, and, and license. Uh, you know, and, and, and Lena touched on this, you know, you can provide a position of assertion or defense. So you, you can sue people that, that are encroaching on your, on your property, inverted commas. Um, a key part of this discussion is that IP can provide a return on investment. And, and, and you know, you cannot really dismiss the, the cost of, of development of, of vaccines. It, it is in the billions. Um, 
notwithstanding, I guess, some of the, the, the current uh, improvements with mRNA vaccines. Um, IP allows you to build goodwill and reputation. Um, we, we all know our luxury brands, we all know our cheap go-tos. Um, it can help drive capital investment. And, and a key point too is it, it, it can enable risk min minimization. Um, I touched, I'll touch on these uh, points um, shortly. But let's, let's just talk about patents. I mentioned before, patents protect how things function, how things work. Uh, they can protect products. Um, the, the actual patent um, that is granted, it is a, a, legal a legally enforceable right to exclude others from exploiting an invention. And exploiting, the word exploiting has a particular legal context. Um, you know, it can apply to making, selling, using, importing a product offering a product for sale. Um, patent rights are obtained on a country by country basis. So if, if you're looking to patent your invention, um, you, you do have to be specific and, and think about strategy as to where you protect your, your concept. Um, it's, you know, it'd be financially uh, prohibitive to, to think about protecting it in every single country of the world. And therefore, you know, innovators, um, particularly pharmaceutical companies will protect markets, um, as Lena pointed out, that, they, that they're likely to get a financial return. Um, and provided that you meet the threshold for um, patenting, um, you can get up to 20 years protection. Um, so the key, key, I guess, the fundamental components of, of, of why we have patents um, the patent monopoly is, is really an exchange. It's, it's about that exchange of information. We've all heard that, that term. We live in a, a knowledge economy. Knowledge is, is really the new oil. Um, patents require the person seeking protection to disclose how to make the product, how to make their invention. And in exchange, they get that monopoly right. Um, so without that disclosure, um, that disclosure um, would be considered, you know, a trade secret, and nobody be, would, would know really what the the inventive concept would be unless unless you know you, you try to reverse engineer. So, uh, you know, having that knowledge drives innovation. Um, to to be patentable, to have a patentable invention, you must meet certain threshold check tests through the examination process that patents undergo. Um, the patent patented invention must be new, it must be novel, and it must meet an inventiveness standard. So it can't just reproduce what is already out there. That's that's a, a key element of, of patents. Um, and the monopoly, of course, encourages investment. Um, if you can have a position of exclusivity, you can take greater risks. Um, what can patents be used to protect? Well, in the context of a vaccine, you can protect a number of different things. The, the vaccine con construct per se, parts of the vaccine, um, adjuvants, things that stabilize the actual formulation. You can protect, protect how the vaccine is manufactured. You can also protect um, methods of administration, me methods of vaccination. Now, I put, I put the asterisks there because in some countries, methods of treatments uh, are not allowed and claims to methods of treatments, but in, in some jurisdictions they are. Um, just uh, as a bit of, I guess, knowledge here, you know, we, we, we've all heard about, I guess, Moderna and Pfizer um, developing their mRNA vaccines. But if you look at the New York Times, um, New York Times has a coronavirus tracker uh, and there are currently a, a numerous uh, vaccines in, in, in production. Um, Interestingly, Moderna has listed on its webpage all the patents that are relevant to its vaccine platform. And, and the key here is, is that the vaccine, Moderna's vaccine is, uh, is patented insofar as the pat platform is patented. So Moderna has developed technology that allows RNA to be stabilized at um, not uh, you know, minus 70 degrees like Pfizer's, it, it's slightly warmer, you know, it still needs to be cold, but it's the platform per se. And, you know, that those patents, uh, in the initial filings were around 2017. So, so they weren't just um, yesterday and they are published. Um, just touching on briefly too, I guess, um, 
something that that Lena also discussed about um, patent term and 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 um, data generated through uh, the clinical trials process. This this oops sorry this figure on the left here um, shows a schematic of which aligns uh, the clinical sort of studies with with the patent um, uh, t uh, term of protection. Um, it is partly uh, correct. I, I did borrow this slide and I put the source there, but in fact, the, the patent protection actually begins a lot earlier. It can be, begin actually at least 30 months earlier than this. You know, the term of protection is starting at zero is, is the filing date of what we would call a, a, an international patent application. But the R&D uh, that goes into deciding whether to patent begins a lot earlier and perhaps even before the preclinical studies. But I, I, the point of this slide is really um, to highlight a couple of things. Number one, up until the point that a, a patented product is approved um, via a, a, a country's a health regulator, um, there is no sale. So really, uh, so up until that point, in order to get to the, to the point of actually having a product for sale, somebody needs to pay for those costs. And so that, that's really where, where, you know, from a, a patent attorney's perspective, um, the, the value comes in terms of being able to supply that, that R&D chain in having a monopoly right. Um, that is that is one advantage of having patent protection. The other, the other highlight here is, is uh, something that, that Lena touched on in terms of generics. Um, there is a period in which the regulatory authorities will protect um, data that is submitted by an originator. And that, that data protection period um, is, is a period in which the generics uh, cannot get their hands on the, the data that they need to have their products approved, which are you know, identical to the originator's products. So, Alina is right in a way that that you know there there are currently um, impediments to generics enter, entering the market because there isn't that transparency. Um, this being sort of the standard type of flow, um, you know, it, it's interesting to note the how rapid the the acceleration has been with with the mRNA vaccines. It's been incredible. You know, we we only really discovered COVID and last year in December, and, and we already have vaccines released in the market today, unprecedented acceleration. Um, and it's, it, it, it is a game changer. So, you know, that will have an impact on, on cost. It, it's, there's still risk, a risk element, um, but, but it, it is, you know, it's, it's setting, setting new standards. Um, patent system per se, I, I don't believe the patent system per se um, should, um, prevent access, it shouldn't. Um, really, patents, you know, are a tool, like, like Lena said, but they, they should be used for good uh, as opposed to, you know, used for evil, um, inverted commas. Um, there are bigger issues, I think. You know, we, we've talk, touched on politics, um, pre existing economic and social problems. I mean, just the logistics of getting mRNA vaccines to poor countries with, with no cold chain facilities is just going to be incredibly difficult to solve. Um, TRIPS, Doha, the, these, these agreements and regimes provide a framework um, that allow IP rights to be recognised and protected, but they include mechanisms that allow poorer countries to get access to those, those um, important therapeutics. People would have heard of things like compulsory licenses and crown use, where people can apply to governments or courts to, to gain access to to produce. You know, generics can get gain access earlier to produce um, patented technologies. Possibly other mechanisms um, that we could rely on to to improve access, but they're not always straightforward. Um, patent pools, voluntary licensing. Pledges of non-enforcement. Interesting that Moderna has said that it will not enforce these patents during the pandemic. Um, Incentivisation subsidies. You know, all of these will be thrown in the mix. I think, and I don't think there's going to be one straightforward solution.
So I'll stop there. I did promise Mark that if I go over time, I'd buy him a beer. So uh, that's enough for me for the moment. Um, oh. looking for questions. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I think you do bring up some points where we can really kind of see that there could be a healthy discussions amongst the panelists. Uh, so, uh, but before we get into that, I'll introduce our next speaker, who is Mark Finlay, who is a professor of law at the Singapore Management University. He's also the director of its Center for Artificial Intelligence and Data Governance, where he is a professorial research fellow. In addition, he holds many other positions that I couldn't possibly list them because there were so many. They're chairs in various academic institutions across Australia, Hong Kong, Singapore, England, Ireland. So um, he's also authored a very large number of monograms, collections, articles, book chapters. So and if you want details for all our speakers, you will have uh, a link uh, uh, on our website when we post the, the recording of this webinar. Um, currently, Mark is working on a range of regulatory issues related to COVID-19 and has also published a number of articles in this area. And I think today he's going to provide us a little overview of this work and while situating it in a larger context of what's happening. So over to you, Mark. Thanks, Alina, and thanks for the invitation to participate. And thank you to my two previous panelists who were right on time. Uh, so I do have a little bit of time to, to spend uh, mulling over some ideas. Chris is right, patents don't prevent access, price prevents access. And uh, the issue of price is a question that will, I think, become uh, much more relevant when we get into the medium term with uh, the vaccines that are coming out in relation to uh, COVID and COVID protection. I want to present a couple of, uh, let's say, um, provocative ideas in relation to the regulation of uh, vaccine distribution uh, in uh, several contexts, some of which relate to the work that we've done and some of which relate to what's going on right at this moment. Today's an interesting day, for example, because uh, in the UK, uh, the UK government has, has, has um, given emergency approval to one vaccine to be available. Uh, on the same day that there was a report that one of the vaccine companies was going to sue a participant in one of the trials uh, for alleging that uh, he got sick as a result of being involved in the trial process. There's a lot of energy going on at the moment in relation to, to vaccines and vaccine, um, uh, vaccine issues. I want to talk about vaccines in the, in, the, in the context of an Olympics. We didn't have an Olympics uh, in Tokyo this year, but we've certainly got a vaccine Olympics going on at the moment. And I think Chris has alluded quite nicely to the, the fact that there are externalities that are going to impact on the way in which vaccines are accessible and regulated well beyond the question of IP. The question of IP is always uh, seen as a paradoxical question between IP and open access, between uh, the uh, individuals who would want to protect the rights of the exclusive license holder and the creators who often would much prefer just to get involved with sharing information to develop the um, standard of knowledge. I think that the, the situation we're currently facing is a bit like the Olympics at large. Firstly, the Olympics pretend to be a celebration of sport globally. So it's a sort of global uh, engagement. But really what they are is they're a battle between nation states for priority. And what we have here is we've got a situation where vaccines are being promoted as an answer to a global health pandemic, but they're being promoted very much nation state focused. So we've got nation states who have bought up large supplies on spec, assuming that the vaccine would be available primarily for their population and their citizens. Um, and it's right to suggest that this is going to certainly unbalance the debate about access and the way in which access goes forward. So it would be foolish, I think, to suggest that this is a global uh, enterprise designed to benefit uh, uh, global citizens worldwide. Um, and I think also associated with that is just the, 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 the reality that uh, so much discussion is um, uh, emerging around philanthropic approaches to access, 
not so much equitable approaches to access, but philanthropic approaches to access to try and cover uh, the rest of the world that doesn't necessarily have this pref preferential arrangement through nation state sponsorship. I'd just like to emphasize that as being important because one of the reasons that vaccines are advanced as such a cure-all, particularly the pandemics, is to get the majority of people vaccinated. And so it's not the vaccine, but it's the vaccination that makes the difference. And there are many, many externalities that are gonna stand in the way of vaccination, whether that be voluntary refusal or the fact that uh, populations can't uh, get enough access simply because of uh, lack of production, lack of distribution or whatever it might be. I just wanna ask a, a couple of quick questions uh, before my time is up. These are the sorts of questions that regulators ask when they're trying to uh, plan out a regulatory strategy, whether it's to resist IP, whether it's to advance IP, uh, whether it's to uh, support trade uh, secrets approaches or whatever. Um, and these questions revolve around sort of four concepts for me. One is open access. Uh, the other is, is patents as, as Chris has put forward. The third is trade secrets and the fourth is theft. Um, and it's an interesting issue that we've had allegations of some countries being involved in cyber theft, uh, trying to access the information that um, is precluded from them as part of the secrecy of vaccine production. Uh, again, an emphasis on the fact that this is, part, it is primarily an exercise which eventually will be profit making uh, and will be uh, something that comes within the normal frame of pharmaceutical development. Quick questions, for what? Vaccines for what? Well, we'd think it would be for health and safety, but in fact, there's a bigger push and the push is for reopening economies, uh, for global travel, uh, for trade in, in, in a wider sense, and also this discussion of getting back to normal, whatever normal might have been. The second is for who? And for who, this is a very problematic question when you're talking about the regulatory frameworks in place that are being contested by different countries at different times in different ways. State sponsorship means for who is very sectarian, it's very nation state focused. Um, if we want universal access, for example, why should that depend on philanthropy? Why wouldn't that depend on health common sense or depend on a global consciousness? rather than the idea that we should simply be generous to the poor, rather than realizing that global vaccination is a benefit for all. Uh, for when? Well, we've seen this, as, as has been mentioned before, this amazing uh, rush to develop. Uh, and this has been partly a, uh, let's say, an accelerated science. Some people say it's a reduction in uh, sensible scientific regulation. Some say it's, uh, incredible political pressure uh, that's been placed on uh, scientists and developers to push vaccines forward. And because of the rapid rate of development, this crea creates another problem for regulators. One of the problems being, there will be a significant number of those in society who will resist vaccination because they don't believe it's safe. And this brings up the question then, will states be uh, pressuring their citizens either through uh, vaccination passports or through direct pressure uh, to take up the vaccines. Uh, finally, for where? Well, there's absolutely no doubt, as both speakers have touched upon, that it, this is a North World benefit first up. Um, this is where it's being developed. This is where it's being discussed. Uh, the vaccines, for example, in China and the uh, the Russian Federation have been significantly doubted by those who are developing vaccines in the West. Uh, and I don't see a great thirst, a great energy uh, for marketing vaccines in those countries that are not considered to be standard commercial markets. I don't see great variance in this vaccine marketing uh, with what we've seen with HIV AIDS marketing, except for one thing. And that is that the political expectations for the cure-all that vaccine poses are so, um, let's say, so large, so significant, so spoken about, uh, so, so uh, vital and vigorous, uh, that they're going to have as much of an impact on the way in which vaccines are pushed out and pushed forward uh, than perhaps uh, price might or even uh, IP rights protections. The downside, safety, 
is obviously an issue. The second issue is medium term cost. I'm not so much concerned about short term cost because I think short term cost will be modified so that there can be, for example, uh, the good farmers, the farmers with the reputation that are considered to be uh, conscious of the um, the social good that they're performing in relation to making this vaccine available. So it's a reputational benefit counteracted against cost in the short term. Um, accessibility, this is going to be a terrible, terrible problem. And it's not just whether the vaccines are kept cool, but simply the fact that a vast amount of the stocks of the vaccine are already bought up before they hit, hit the, the, the chemist's table. Uh, and so we've got a disproportionate and unequal uh, structuring of the way in which these vaccines will go forward. And finally, legitimacy. I would suggest that one of the arguments that is behind the preferential availability of vaccines, first to frontline workers, then to uh, institutionalised aged care, then to others in the vulnerable groups, that's as much about legitimacy as it is about a big heart because we realize that in many countries, uh, the, the healthcare system is collapsing as a consequence of either the pressures of the pandemic or just simply under-resourcing. And associated with that, we've got a pre-existing discriminatory attitude to many, many groups in society, migrant workers, aged care that are in uh, institutions that we never ever cared about prior to the pandemic. Pandemic comes along and all of a sudden we've got a social conscience. So I think what we're going to find is that the access issue, once the vaccine has, uh, or the vaccines have become more prevalent and more available, is going to become the most contentious question uh, that regulators will need to consider. Push it forward, make it equal, uh, hold it back, make it pricey. Uh, very, very interesting questions that regulators will face. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mark. That was a whole host of, of issues that you raised. I mean, you really cover the entire context, the political, the economic, the, uh, uh, you know, human rights, accessibility from different angles. So uh, it's kind of uh, difficult to even like, think of how to sort out some of these issues. But maybe uh, I, I'm looking at some of the questions that have been posed, and they do uh, kind of uh, have been asking about, you know, the, the debate of, well, if IP rights are not protected, uh, then will the people be willing to do this kind of research and development in the future? And how do you do that? And that's like a perennial question that comes up, you know, when you have the two sides of, you know, should you have a waiver of uh, IP rights in certain contexts, or do you have a protection of IP rights because of, you know, the R&D that kind of goes inherent? So uh, maybe I'll ask all three of you to address that question, but maybe Lena, I could, maybe you could start with even addressing that question in the context of uh, looking at the HIV AIDS story, because I think that has so much to to tell us about some the way you know we can learn from history what happened and you know how things unfolded and then kind of address this whole debate of you know how do you balance these two kind of opposing uh, uh, arguments but really with keeping in mind that we do want to achieve equitable outcomes yeah i mean uh, so the challenge actually is uh, is undoing some of the myths in people's minds which are actually often repeated by the legal and academic community at large is that without ip we won't have innovation what will happen to innovation and i think we've answered this before in the terms of neglected diseases and showed several reports to show that no matter how much ip you offer neglected diseases and the therapies that you need for them will will never be invested in through the IP system. But more recently, I think one of the problems with the debate on IP and innovation in the COVID context, for example, is the fact that people are not looking at the riskiest part of R&D is actually subsidized by governments. Now we can have a debate about which governments do it more and which governments do it less. And those are things that could be resolved by one of the proposals at the WHO regarding an R&D treaty and equitable contribution to R&D. However, the fact remains that a lot of the R&D and outcomes of R&D are collectively uh, 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 funded by the taxpayer, by the public, um, and often what is actually commercialized by the company or licensed by the company is the less riskier phase. And 
During the process of clinical trials and registration, we've seen this in imatinib in, in Novartis, which is a classic example where the drug came from a public lab. It was licensed to Novartis. And then they were given subsidies and often drug status by the various regulatory bodies. Uh, and then on top of that, a patent monopoly. So I think this is where I think I just don't agree with that myth that IP is driving innovation in a manner that if you uh, uh, make changes to the IP system, you know, in some ways, innovation will collapse. I think innovation is happening in different ways. And the pandemic has actually shown that, that because countries faced a practical economic collapse, and millions of people lost their livelihoods and people were dying, people, uh, the government started to start and fund more and more uh, the scale up of manufacturing and R&D. So once you put in public money, you can't have it under proprietary control. And I think this is where um, I think uh, one of the things that we would actually like to highlight as people who've started to you know, fund R&D and do clinical trials and contributed to the collective development of data, for example, on Bedaculin and, and Deliminid, um, that the monopoly structure of the IP system doesn't work for us and it will not work for the COVID-19 pandemic. Chris, did you want to add something? Sure, uh, look, um, very, very strong words, Lena. Uh, <laughs> And, and look, I, I don't necessarily disagree with everything you've said. Um, that there's, there's, you know, if, if I can pick an example, um, you know, I, I'm familiar with uh, the commercialization of the Gardasil vaccine. That research began in the 90s in the University of Queensland, and that research was initially government funded. Um, at a, what, you know, I, I do a lot of work in the university sectors, and universities are just not geared to take a product to market. They'll get to a certain point and, and then just, you need critical mass. You need, you need the infrastructure. You need, um, you need the, the buildings that's gonna house the fermenters to, to develop the proteins. Um, that is cost, that is, that is based on cost. And, and to, to take a risk um, in, in, I guess, in that investment, um, there needs to be some I guess, leverage, and, and that's what the monopoly right provides. Um, equally, I guess, you know, your, your point about, you know, it, it, it's hard not to, to take that, you know, ch it's a chicken and an egg type situation. Um, if, if you don't have the incentivization, will you have the investment? Um, and, and as Mark said, well, you, you can't always rely on philanthropy. Um, I just think that that you know, the patent system and and monopoly rights have their place, but they they're not the they're not the panacea. They're not the complete solution. Um, we do have to work out better ways to deliver drugs to those in need, and and whether that means you know relying on things like compulsory licensing. Australia, you know, has committed itself to. Um, um, it recently amended its laws to, to allow gen generics to apply for compulsory licenses to supply drugs to poorer countries. Um, you know, there are, there are things happening. I think the farmers are, are recognizing, you know, they do want to be good corporate citizens. Um, but I think, you know, it, it's hard to dismiss the value in, in having a monopoly right. I mean, the, the, it is, it is, you know, they're, they're it's a two-edged sword. Yeah. Uh, sorry, just to just to do a quick response to this that you sure. know you mentioned. Uh, uh, you know, I, I've worked on breast cancer and I've worked on Gardasil, and you know, uh, it's one of the vaccines that's just not available in developing countries. And no matter uh, how much IP we grant, it's it's not going to make that vaccine available to us. And we have to look at alternative supply. Mm. Uh, while it may work in a particular context like Australia, it definitely does not work. For MSF and, and developing countries, we've been asking for the HPV vaccines uh, from the companies and they just do not want to provide it because the prices are so high that they know that MSF will start advocating to reduce prices. Having said that, and I think it's so ironic that today pharma is going to be arguing for compulsory licensing because they spent a vast fortune undermining our right to issue compulsory licenses. Mm. And this is what the TRIPS waiver proposal does. 
it has actually shown pharma for what it is. Um, if, I, if you look at PHRMA's submission uh, to the 301 USTR list, uh, what have they said systematically? That you should not challenge patents, you should not be, you should be granting more secondary patents and compulsory licenses are absolutely no, no. They have dismantled our committees for compulsory licensing, undermined our, our, our systems systematically, uh, bribed, corrupted our systems uh, to allow compulsory licensing to work, pressurized our politicians and leaders and governments to not issue compulsory licenses, even when um, you know, women with breast cancer, I, I, you know, my friends and were just dying and there was no way they were going to pay for patented Roche's uh, trastuzumab. So I think it's, it's ironic uh, that they today argue for compulsory licensing and they're using TRIPS flexibility and, and uh, compulsory licensing as a defense for India and South Africa to not take the waiver forward. I think this is, these are very interesting times uh, yeah. for patent reform. And, uh, and I would just like to highlight, even in the middle of the pandemic, USTR shamelessly issued the 301 report, telling countries don't issue compulsory licenses. And no, I think- can I, can I jump over the top yeah, of this? Absolutely. Um, I, I think the issue is, there, there are two fundamental questions here that, that, that would, I think, expose the difficulties that we face with IP in relation to vaccines in the third world or in the south world. One is the fact that it's not the patent that's the problem, it's the excessive royalties that are claimed. So the fact that we have all this uh, disproportionate discussion about the cost of R&D, and in fact, the cost of R&D are bloated, and we have a situation where the uh, returns that are expected by the big pharmaceutical companies have been uh, exposed as excessive. So uh, that's the first question. And the second question I think is one of these great capitalist paradoxes that we want to protect uh, monopoly rights in relation to IP, but we want the market to be competitive. And they don't, it doesn't work. It doesn't work like that. And so I think really the challenge to IP is not so much a sort of fundamental re, uh, rethinking of IP, but rather looking at it from a commercial market perspective. If some markets are not profitable and we must get the vaccines or the, the drugs out into those markets, how do we do that in a financial sense? And then how do we deal with excessive royalty claims? Um, I don't think we're ever going to get into a situation where we have competitive markets because we don't have competitive markets almost anywhere. Uh, so I think it's unlikely that we're going to have it in the pharmaceutical sector. But it is ultimately the excessive royalty claims that are the problem. Well, it's interesting that you raise this because uh, if the issue was on royalty, which basically assumes that there is a remuneration system in place for us to be paying royalties for developing countries, producers who face patent barriers to be able to pay royalties and go ahead and produce those products. And I'm not just talking about COVID-19, but the fact remains that they are not willing to license. Uh, uh, a large number of medicines and technologies uh, to developing country manufacturers. And, um, you know, about getting uh, uh, the products into the countries where, you know, governments or people can't pay is also uh, a part of that experience of MSF has been to look at supply and, uh, you know, allowing these countries to scale up their own production of these life-saving products. We saw Brazil produce antiretrovirals, we saw Thailand produce antiretrovirals. We've seen India produce antiretrovirals. We've seen Bangladesh starting to produce. And why not use that capacity in, in, in developing countries to allow them to respond to this big crisis? And it's not just about vaccines, because in MSF, we are dealing with oxygen, we're dealing with ventilators, we're dealing with masks, we're dealing with drugs. And MSF is very, very interested in the pipeline of medicines. It's not just vaccines that we are looking for. And we're looking for these countries to be able to produce these uh, products and, and scale up uh, production and, and global supply. Yeah, I think, thanks, Lena. That was kind of a really interesting point. And both, so, you know, what you mentioned here about the uh, manufacturing capacities in certain countries and, Mark, what you mentioned kind of a little bit earlier when you were talking about some of, you know, the fact that there are a lot of these bilateral agreements uh, for uh, vaccines already in place and really the which countries will be able to take that supply or not. We will be taking up this issue in great depth in our next webinar where we have people, you know, talking about that. So I don't want to get into those issues right now in our limited time. I 
I did want to take up because here we are, you know, we have all you lawyers uh, present. So is this an opportunity to think, you know, we are kind of in this crazy, uh, unusual situation to rethink some of these patent laws in terms of, so not to dismantle the whole situation, but Chris, you point out the timeline. You know, everyone's talking the timeline for vaccine development is, you know, amazing, right? So usually one of the things is, well, normally it takes us 10 years to develop a vaccine or, you know, any other kind of related product. And that's one of the reasons we also have to keep these high prices because we've had so much time and investment gone into it. Well, in this case, for one, you've had some public funding supporting it. For two, you've had a hugely accelerated timeline in terms of the regulatory aspects and the approvals and you know all that um, sphere. So, can we also think of a corresponding shortening of patent time? Uh, you know, so so we don't go do away with it, but we adjust it in certain ways to respond to these new things, and we also take that message and that um you know a story into other products later on so that we so we're not otherwise it seems like you know we're always stuck in the same model are the different models where we are not throwing everything out but we are adjusting it to be more equitable and more accessible so maybe chris and mark you guys would like to address that yeah look I, oh, changing the patent system holus bolus is is a difficult ask um obviously not not something that is straightforward and and you know governments spend a lot of time you know, we've, we've had recent amendments to our our patents act recently they spend a lot of time consulting with stakeholders it's not something that is easily done um i i think you know i i do want to make the point of of you know the system per se and you know it grants the right it, it's obviously the person who gains that right that monopoly right and how they use that power is is something distinct really from from the system per se um so you know i don't i don't see the system being amended as as you, you've pointed out it, to to account for differentials in 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 production or, or uh timelines or it would be hugely difficult to to standardize that i think um i think it's got to come downstream. There's got to be, you know, you know, perhaps some incentivization to get companies who are capable of manufacturing the large amount of doses to vaccination, vaccinate a population to look at delivering that product to the poorer countries. Um, you know, there's got to be some other, other opportunity uh, rather than tampering with, with this, you know, the system per se. I think just to come in over that, that mm. Chris is right, that, that um, the, the creation of the right is one thing, the exercise of the right is the other, but we just have this dreadful history of individuals that have monopoly rights exploiting them. Mm. Uh, and it's very hard in a corporate sector where you do have monopolies rather than competitive markets uh, to expect that morals are going to overcome profit. But I think the big thing that lawyers have to realise, and, and we've been working on this recently, is that we're becoming irrelevant. Uh, if you ask anyone under the age of 35 whether they download information from the internet in an unauthorised way and do they care about copyright, almost every kid in the world that I know breaks the law every day. Uh, now, what that does is it challenges copyright from a very mundane base. People are just saying, we don't care. We don't care. We, you know, what's going to happen to us if we do this? We're not going to go to jail. There's too many of us. Uh, and so you've, you've got Spotify. You've got, you've got Netflix coming uh, in, in a very crude and, uh, and let's say a, a disjointed way to try and create license-based environments which don't necessarily rely on the old-fashioned royalties. And that's just pragmatic. That's realising the fact that, uh, you know, if something's not done, then... Lawyers might say, well, it's like throwing a rock through Tiffany's window, but it's not. It's not what people are not seeing it that way. I think the patent system will be different. I think the patent system does have much more integrity and much more credibility than copyright ever does. Uh, but if you talk to young developers about innovation, the majority of AI people that we talk to do not believe that IP promotes innovation. And they're much more interested in uh, open access. Now, if that's true, then the challenge is for the lawyers to say, OK, well, you know, the, if, if that's the case, then we've got to start saying to our clients, be more responsible with the rights you've got. 
rather than, as I think Chris is right, to say we're going to get a radical rethink of, of the law. Because see what's happening internationally with uh, TRIPS and a variety of other issues is that IP is being used as a political tool. It's being used as trade bargains. It's being used as a way of bargaining aid or no aid. And it's coming from the big IP holders, China, uh, the US, the hegemonic IP owners. Now, is that IP's fault? No, it's not IP's fault. That's a political problem. Uh, and they're the questions I think we need to be looking at uh, as lawyers from the inside and also looking at the real world uh, to see whether we continue to be as relevant as we should be. Yeah, I think that's yeah. absolutely right. And it's going to some of the political challenges, you know, that we all do. But I'm also conscious of the time. We are kind of right at our time. But uh, I think well, let's hope that people stay on for a few minutes longer. And maybe um, I'll ask kind of in the order that we started speaking, uh, just everyone to give their last kind of uh, you know, closing statement or maybe maybe a wish list of what you would like to see next uh, might be a good way to end uh, so that we kind of end on a positive note. Uh, so, Lina? Yeah, I mean, indeed, uh, a good debate to have. And uh, um, I think there were some very valid points from the other speakers. Um, I just wanted to highlight a couple of things that, you know, uh, what uh, uh, people are actually asking for from South Africa to Brazil to India. Uh, is not scrapping of the intellectual property system, but reform and accountability. Uh, that means better patent examination, compulsory licensing to work, and the right to challenge poor quality patents. So I don't think so that this is about scrapping the intellectual property system. Uh, it's also asking for accountability, accountability for public investments. And I think uh, like we invest in anything, we ask for that collective uh, responsibility that you know something that has been collectively uh, created should be then collectively organized and um, uh, distributed. So I think these are some of the things that MSF has sort of worked with in developing countries. The last thing I wanted to say is this, what India and South Africa have actually done, have put something on the table that allows people to debate and discuss what the solutions for the COVID-19 pandemic will be. While we discuss the IP system, we also discuss what Mark really pointed out, that a few countries uh, in the name of nationalism have captured the supply of vaccines for at least for 2021. You, you may see a scale up and better equitable access later on. Um, and I think this is something that, um, you know, uh, governments need to do more, whether it's in the context of IP or technology transfer or the distribution of vaccines. Um, you know, governments need to take onus. Um, lastly, I think uh, as a person, you know, a South Asian woman of color, I would like to say, I don't like words like rich and poor. I don't like to believe that mRNA vaccines necessarily are precluded from countries just because Pfizer created one that <laughs> cannot be utilized easily in resource poor countries. Someone might came up, come up with the mRNA uh, vaccine, which is much more um, tuned in to the kind of cold chains we have in developing countries. Um, and I would also like to sort of call out the Wall Street Journal on the manner in which it has sort of put down developing countries uh, and the ability to, to produce uh, um, for, for, you know, scaling up supply for, for their own needs and globally. So I think these are the sort of thoughts uh, I would like to stop on. Great. Thank you. Yes, absolutely echo that in terms of, you know, every life is as important as any other. So uh, don't, we shouldn't be like discounting that in terms of, you know, the context they live in. Um, Chris? Look, I, I really, um, and well, thank you to the other two speakers for providing some, some great points of thought here. And I think that's really um, the value in this session is to give people food for thought to take away and, and just really ask the questions that they, they should be asking uh, of themselves, but also, you know, maybe even push them up the chain to, to relevant government authorities. Um, I, I guess, you know, we, we focus on the, the, the current key players in the market, um, but, but there are likely going to be other technologies that are going to be more amenable to um, delivery of vaccines to third world countries. Um, we, we shouldn't lose sight of the bigger picture, I guess, uh, is my point. But, um, you know, it, it's such a complex question uh, that this, this presentation is put together. I don't think there's any going to be any one particular solution. 
Um, there's always competing interests. At the end of the day, I'm, I'm, you know, the costs to get a vaccine up uh, into, a, to, into a marketplace, you, you can't deny it. Somebody has to pay for it. Um, uh, how are we going to, to, to level the playing field? It's, it's just not clear. So hopefully I've, I've given you food for thought. Um, if you have questions, particularly about patents, I'm uh, open to taking questions by email. My email's up there, but otherwise, um, hope you enjoyed it. Absolutely. And actually, we will ask, so we, we managed to kind of answer some of the questions. I didn't read them out word to word, but I was looking at them and, you know, kind of trying to address the, the spirit of the questions. But uh, we maybe there were some that we didn't get to. So we would uh, uh, send them to you guys by email and see if you would like to, you know, give a written res short response. And that would be great. We'll post it on our website. So I do want to keep this dialogue going, you know. So Mark, do you want to give your final comments? Yeah, I'll just uh, say a couple of things briefly. I, I, I think the three speakers provoked uh, the questions that needed to be asked and that from different perspectives showed that there are different uh, forces at work here that we need to be considering. But I think we can go back to something that's pretty fundamental. Uh, the pandemic is a global problem. The response to the pandemic has been a self-interested, chaotic, uh, and in many places, ineffectual response. And I fear that the, uh, the approach to the vaccines uh, will be somewhat the same. And part of that is due, as far as I'm concerned, to two things that we need to seriously look at as global citizens. The first is that should uh, the uh, protection of the world uh, from things like dangers to health and safety depend on politics and wealth. Um, and it's, this is a, a quite an individual human question. It's a question about, do we care about the person next to us or do we care about our wallet? Uh, the second issue, which I think is incredibly important here for lawyers, is that the law, the law and the way in which the law is created, uh, in some respects, offers opportunity for greed and bad practice, but also opportunities for social good. And unfortunately, the majority of young lawyers that I teach have come from a background where they believe that, it, that a law degree is a passport to wealth. And that as far as they're concerned, law is something which you commodify and sell and make money out of. And I think lawyers are going to have to start thinking whether they're IP lawyers or whoever they might be about the concept of law being a community resource, as well as something that can support the wealth of the world. And if we don't start seeing that soon, the pandemic is one thing, but I can tell you, climate change is a much bigger problem uh, that's uh, you know one room away. And, and that's where we're really going to be looking at where lawyers and other professionals stand up and say, we're working for social good, because if we don't, we're going to be sidelined. And the rest of the world will basically say, well, the lawyers really haven't got anything to tell us except for their few rich clients. Uh, and as far as we're concerned, that's not a language we want to listen to. So thank you, Mark, for that. Absolutely. And you said these two crucial words, social good, which I, I you know, like to cling on to. And I, I just kind of also add my sentence of I, why do we sometimes now seem to hesitate to say that we want to address an issue from a social justice concern, from a point of view that, yes, that is the ultimate goal. It's not maybe, the you know, always the economics and the politics and the, you know, what uh, kind of the financial situation. We want to approach it from a social justice good. And I think that's a perspective maybe that, uh, you know, is an important one to keep in mind. But I can't keep you all here lo longer, even though I would love to. And thank you to all three speakers so much for being part of this. I hope we can continue this dialogue in, you know, different ways. I do hope for the participants, you've kind of um, got new perspectives on these very complex issues. They, as we said, there's no answers and we can't, you know, hope to give you a, a pat answer in, you know, one hour. But we hope to have brought up, you know, perspectives that are important to keep in mind and to continue to think about it and engage over time uh, on both COVID-19, but the larger issues that this has brought up. So, and do listen to our next webinar, which will talk more of the distributional challenges challenges and some what's happening at the country level. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you all. And thank you to my team for always the excellent kind of support that we get. Uh, so it's been a real pleasure to have you.
Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Thank you Mark. Thank you, Meena Thank and you. Mariel and Shreya. Thanks. Thank you all. Thank Thank you. Bye. Stay safe, everybody. Stay safe. Absolutely. Thank you.